This is the Akilimo blueprint. Peter made it actually, and he summarized it very well. If I put it like that, you will not be able to see full of it. So I will, I will just work through around it by, by, by zooming around. So maybe there are three components in it. I mean, just to see, not Akilimo components, but the way to, to, to understand it on the left corner, that will be when there is already a pre-calculated uh, recommendation and it is just uh, with a lookup table or something, a key, pick and give recommendation. And in the middle, it is the user data collection and in the in the far end, in the right end side, uh, hand side, that is uh, when you are yet to generate your, your recommendation. That is, uh, in general, that is how it looks like. And if you see it on the left corner, that is then when you have a pre-calculated uh, pre uh, um, advisory. Um, if, if, if the interface you are using is capable of picking a GPS, uh, in the chatbot you can do that. In mobile app you can do that, but in, in, a, in a lookup table, in maps and so on, that, that, that you cannot, you will have a recommendation, but you cannot do that. So, if it cannot work with a, with with um, a GPS, you will go by whatever aggregation label you have, right? Uh, whether it is being a state, province, Gavale, uh, Warada, whatever that you have, you will go by that. You will pick if there is a recommendation available. You just deliver if um, if there is no recommendation. You will just have to stop and go on the other end, right? So this one is more, more interesting. The, the data analytics, the thing that this group need to understand mostly, that is on this part of the, the analytics. So what is happening here is uh, in the first instance, we just collect all the data, right? From the weather data from NASA and GIRPS, the soil data is dry, is weak, and, and some cassava crop parameters. So this is trying to reflect what exact what Akilimo is now, but it's not limiting it in any way. For instance, if you are going to use, if you're going to work in Ethiopia and if you don't have digital elevation model considering there, you will fail miserably. So you need that. If you have soil moisture in the DVI, the other satellite image, whatever, a geospatial data, your database will come down on this level. You can extend it as many databases as as, as you have. And then you come into assembling, aligning, sourcing this, this data first. When you get it, it can be uh, on a continent level or, or whatever. But then you need to define your, your study area, how your, what kind of resolution you want and so on. And you will have at the end of the day some GPS coordinates that you picked within your target area. And for those ones, you will source them, you will arrange them, you will run your pedo transfer functions. You just prepare your data to have all the parameter input to have, right? And those processed data will get into this spatial soil weather database. You, you dump your, your data there. And next to that, what do you have is the, uh, the Sandman agronomy database. Uh, Sandman is the smart agronomic data management system we have. This will be replaced by data scribe with an EIA uh, because it takes a, a strong learning from agrofims. It, it just, combines Sandman and Agrofims. Agrofims is what Meda and her team were, have been working for a very long time, a very strong uh, component of agronomic data management system because it brings the, the, the ontology and the semantics and all those things. And the Sandman brings in a possibility, it is, it is tested for five, six years. It is a way of designing digital forums standard way of sending it out, collecting data centrally, link them and, and make it available for user. Therefore, you will use it as a database at the back, at the back of your, um, your, your, your dashboards or data analytics, whatever, right? So that one will contain then here, the, again, the agronomy database. Using data, data scribe, uh, we will be able to build that one. And then of course you will have your, your area uh, and, and so on. So the default value database that I will come later uh, to that one. So for the cassava crop par parameters, you will you will prepare, especially if you want to build a generic system that doesn't exactly work for only maize or for only cassava, whatever. It is better to have 
uh, a system in the way that it will just call on to that database and query out the data. That that kind of flexibility would be would be useful. Um, you go on. I mean, you create, you process, you 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 Thank calibrate you. your yeah. Wandla. Uh, do you mind if we interrupt when we want to ask? No, that is exactly what you are encouraged to do. Uh, just asking about the car, the cassava crop parameters. So if we if we were looking at a different crop, yeah. obviously that can be replaced um, can replace what's currently what you're calling cassava crop parameters. Is this the data that we would uh, develop from the validation, or the validation data is sitting somewhere else? No, the validation data will come here in the in the agronomy database. In the data scribe, that will be where the validation data will end up. This this crop cassava uh, crop cassava crop parameters, let's call it the crop parameters. They are already calib from the calibrated model. This ad, for instance, has a parameter uh, how much light life light use efficiency, water use efficiency, growing period, uh, and so on and so on. How wheat interacts with the growing environment. There are parameters unique for wheat, unique for maize, unique for the crops. And those are already, these crop modelers do have these values. Par the parameters have a defined name. They are in the crop models and they do have specific parameters depending on yeah, how deep fine. the so are crop. Okay. You get it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to be sure whether they're in the crop models yes. or is the validation data. Okay, okay, okay. So um, at this point, then we do have the spatial data, we do have our parameters, crop parameters, and we will calibrate our models, right? The crop models. Once we have that with the Nakilimo, what we do is we run lean tool or DSAT to be able to generate the spatial temporal model, the, the water limited yield. What we need is at the end of the day, build our database of the water limited yield, the yield ceiling spatially and, and temporally defined. That is, that's what we need. And one component is that at this point with an Achille model. And the next component is we come into from our uh, agronomy database. It goes through the, the, extra, the, ex, the extract, the curate and, and, and all that processes. What we do with the Achille model is fitting linear mixed effects model to get a structured variability only drop out the variability that comes from we don't know where we cannot give it for location we cannot uh, give it to the treatments or the year so as we cannot say anything about it we want to drop the residual error and go with the variability we say uh, due to the location the yield varies that way due to the treatment the yield is the, the, the one thing we take we want that is the blobs, the best linear uh, unbiased predictors, the, the blobs we, we extract. And then the step is we put it in the quest scrub model. Therefore, we get from the yield that we have to the estimation of soil nutrient supply. After we do that, we scale it up. This modeling, uh, the reverse quest model will give us for our trial area the how much soil nutrient is there in those location, and that will be the input for our machine learning model. And there, the spatial data will come in, the um, relationship, uh, the, the soil nutrient supply that we have for our location will come in, and um, we, scale, we scale that up for to be able to uh, determine the soil fertility all over our target area. And now we are crossing, we are coming in this way. In machine learning, predicting the indigenous nu nutrient supply of the soil. Once we have that, we have most of most of the, the component that we need because the water limited yield tells us the ceiling. We know the soil fertility, how much nutrient is there in the soil. And then we go and predict how much is it than the current yield without any additional data? If we know how, how fertile the soil is, if we know where the limit is, given all the parameters we have, what is what is the yield right now? So if we know what is the yield right now, if we know what is the ceiling, the profitable yield increases between these two. How much yield could be could be increased? But 
as, uh, as, as you all know, Akilimo is not about yield increase, it is about a profitable yield increase. It's about maximizing profit. And that comes like as a big component in here. Around Quaftus, uh, this guy. Hey, you have to go down, 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 down. I don't need you here. Okay. Um, so here, when we run the Quaftus to get um, to get a profitable yield increase, the price optimization is also embedded at this step. In order to do that, that is when this the middle part is coming into play. What is the 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 middle part is giving us the harvesting and the planting date, a planned one. What is the farmer current yield? What the farmer is at this point getting on their field, not a model output of current yield, but what the farmer yield class, a control yield class is, the fertilizer types, and if there are any other additional input, the fertilizer prices locally available on, on how much the farmer would pay. Um, the product price uh, after the crop is uh, ready when they sell it how much would they sell it for how much are they willing to um, how much they are willing to invest and how risk uh, averse or risk lovers they are that kind of indication that will be all to come into this last step um, when we when we did it for the Sasako global use case, um, other components were coming in like uh, the transport costs, um, production costs, that kind of thing, like land preparations, also whatever cost you have, and um, besides the the purely the agronomic uh, practices, the agronomic things that you do. The, all the prices, all the load you have has to come in into this 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 space, and you bring all that together, and you tell them you need to apply that that much, and this is the expected yield increase, and this is the expected profit given the the price matrix that you have. So that is what is in the nutshell, Akilimo. The blueprint looks like this. The for the fertilizer recommendation. <laughs> so if anyone has a question yes uh thank you you on the workflow you say you calibrate uh the desat model but then you use crafts to assess the yields why well, what what happens here I, I i didn't get uh what you meant are you using two models or yeah yeah um, yeah, indeed, the, the DSAT model is to capture the potential yield, the water limited yield, the yield ceiling. The Quaftus model works for um, be between giving the water limited yield is actually an input. The output of DSAT is an input of Quaftus because Quaftus need to know where the limit of the yield is when it is timid. And what it does, Quaftus is about how much soil nutrient you have, how much your crop can uptake, which is defined by the crop parameters, and how much yield can you then get given the soil fertility you have and the, the type of crop you have. Or it go reverse. It will say, if you see this kind of yield on your crop and its crop parameters together, what could be then the soil nutrient? So it is about supply, uptake, yield. It is this three relationship uh, Quaftus is working. But the DSAT or the lean tool is needed to give input to tell Quaftus where the maximum yield is. The data need for, for the Aquilimo is you require for your study area geospatial data that I already explained. And then we, we need the response to nutrient data. We use the nutrient omission trial data, but it doesn't need to be strictly a nutrient omission trial data. But you need to have treatments tested in different combination of application of NPK that we will require. If you have from your target area, that will be very ideal. If you don't have that, but from similar locations, that is a second option. If you don't have any of that, 
you need to provide some literature review in the way that we need to understand how your crop is responding to nutrient application. That is it. Because if you start from a blanket recommendation, you still don't have a tuning thing to say how all crops do not respond similarly for the same amount of nutrients. That is why we need how your crop responds to nutrient. We need that. Uh, it can be pedotransfer function in the worst case where you will use a version one. You will just develop your version one based on some pedotransfer function from some general uh, understanding within the literature. And then with the validation trials that you're doing year after year, you will improve your versions. So that data will also be needed. Additional data in your area of interest, what kind of fertilizers are available? The prices the crop as well together. Any additional farming costs? Uh, how are your farmers? How much can they invest? What kind of risk attitude they have? What is the planting and harvest rate? And what is the flexibility there? If you if you take uh, uh, like uh, grains, grain crops, uh, wheat and, and, and maize, mostly the planting and harvesting window are rather narrow, but due to variety difference, the, the variety depending on the variety you use, it can really be short or long or medium grow, and th th that also need to be known. Um, the farm area of the farmers, if you want to go into really site specific recommendation, right, really tailored to the end of it, that the farmer will get exactly tell you that this is a piece of land. I have this is the size of that, and this is the GPS is there. My local soil fertility indicator that is farmers current yield, not in absolute terms. Not is going to tell you that I was going, I was getting uh, 3.2 ton. No, it's not like that. But in classes, and that class to to capture. For instance, for cassava, we do have five classes where we look, where we say a very poor poor soil giving very poor uh, yield to a very rich soil. But in between, we do have other three classes. And that is captured from the control yield that we know that we have in our database. So in your case, or it has to be expert should advise us saying, actually, a good soil should give that much, a medium soil like that, a poor soil like that. That is an input in our, in our analytics. So, um, this is at this point the data that the data that that we need. Patricia, okay. Here, uh, we'll let out for soil fertility estimation. Do we need to calibrate the Quest's model for a specific area based on in situ soil information? I guess it is based on historical crops and other factors to capture the dynamics. Uh, what calibrates the Quest's uh, we'll let out for the specific location is the soil fertility indicator that we are telling. So the belief is that, you know, as many people are using different things like uh, distance from home state, soil color, uh, a combination of other things uh, as well. Uh, the, the last year crop and all that, all that things uh, they put. But we tasted and the best we get is this soil fertility indicator. Let the farmer tell you in which class he does his ordinary yield lies and you can make it at the at the beginning a little bit wider therefore you won't really uh, miss uh, from one class to another we a little bit wider class you can define and ask them how much they have been getting getting for their crops from this land it doesn't matter last year a year after or this year let them tell you that um that is because we believe not only we believe, at least the, the result, the data analytics also shows is that everything boiled down into yield. Be it weather, be it fertility management, be it their crop cycle, crop rotation culture, whatever it is, it will boil down into, into, into that the yield that they were getting. So that is the tuning parameter. Of course, the other things are also there. Huh? The soil data is there, the rainfall data is there, but the, the the one if you do the, the random forest and the, this this um, variance importance if you plot the one that sticks up and really gives gives you a big power is the local soil fertility indicator. Okay, well that all is okay with that. Uh, any other question? I just wanted to yeah. know if uh, we need uh, can we do can where these curves can there be another model? 
and uh, also one from mid, I will say it, um, uh, on the stand men, they, there is uh, data which maybe could come from household um, uh, surveys. I wanted to know if this can be shared. Oh, yeah, so that we know if we have these data uh, already available or how should we get them if we don't have. OK, yeah. so let me Thank let you. me start from the back question. The data in the Sandman we have is specifically for cassava farmers that we work in Nigeria and Tanzania. If there is a need for for you to have that, the archive data is being put in 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 CCAN. So you could you could source those out, uh, although I, I don't know for what reason you would use it right now. But anyway, just that probably you are. Sorry, Mekla, just to interrupt here, if the data is in CCAN, you can find it through Guardian. Uh, well, Patricia, yeah. And you and I spent some time the last time going through that. So have a look there. But yeah. I'm assuming uh, to Patricia's question, uh, in her case, she's looking for I suppose similar data on soybean farmers in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia. Her starting point yeah. could be to check in uh, in Guardian if such data exists, right? And that's exactly yeah, what we is, went through the last yeah. time after the the last meeting. I spent some time with with Patricia, you know, to kind of go over what what she might be able to find from Guardian. I don't know, Patricia, if you were able to dig further into that, but there were over a hundred data sets that came up. Now I'm sure all of them were not useful, but it would have required somebody who knew what they wanted to go through that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I was assuming that uh, these uh, data from OTK forms would include uh, maybe management, but uh, it's uh, definitely for 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 soy. I'm uh, I'm sorry. I know, uh, Meklit, you're talking about cassava, but my brain is also <laughs> on to the soy crop, which we are going to deal with. So I, I I'm trying to. To be yes, listening, but at the same time looking at how we can also use uh, uh, your approach in terms of uh, uh, the soy crop that we want to work on here in Southern Africa. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, I I understand. Um, so, sorry, Metlit. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, uh, maybe a silly question. Uh, would sorry. would so the the survey day the surveys that you guys did or the survey forms uh, would would those be uh, also part of the um, uh, you know the the toolkit that we are making available as uh, transform so that people can see what the survey looked like and they can tweak it and implement it themselves. Yeah, do you want to answer, Major? Uh, give a bit of what what did what the capability of data scribe would be. Sure. So, um, Metlith and I have tested data scribe. Data scribe is the tool she mentioned earlier that tries to bring together the strengths of um, AgroFIMS, which is its ontology base, so that you know you're generating data that's already standardized, and the the strong work of Sandman in in having a very a uh, nice set of questions and protocols associated with that. Um, so we're trying to put that together in this data scribe tool that will allow us to collect data uh, using a standard set of questions so that, you know, for instance, for one use case, you might have a survey, um, particularly for that use case for whatever reason. But let's take the example of validation, for instance. The validation exercises ideally would have a single survey that's implemented across use cases. If you want to add more questions, so, so you can use that stencil essentially through DataScribe um, to, to collect data, you know, in a standard way across all of the use cases. You, you, you develop the questionnaire once, and once you put in all of those questions, the, the key terms in each question are already standardized for you through the semantic engines behind the tool. Um, when you get the data uh, um, back, that means that your data variables already align to, to the standard terms. And they could be from ontologies, they could be from ICASA variables, they could be from Agrivoc. Uh, we, we are trying to cast a pretty wide net in because, because not 
you know, one solution rarely fits all. Um, so, so, and and then for more socioeconomic types of questions, those are going to be coming in from Romis. So the 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 goal here is to standardize across the use cases across EIA to the extent possible, while allowing some flexibility to to add things that are missing um, through the tool, um, and to use socioeconomic uh, standardized questions where they exist, which is in Romis. I don't know if that's enough of a of a of an overview. I was trying to give it at a pretty high level, but the tool itself is ready. There are some uh, little tweaks that still need to be made. Clearly, uh, it's not as user friendly as we would like for the more sophisticated kinds of ODK syntax. Uh, so you know you would need to understand how to do it in order to add that kind of syntax. Um, but for for sort of more basic kinds of questions. It accepts them. It allows you know it allows you to add standard tools. It puts it forces you to add standard uh, units. Sorry, um, and and it, and it and it forces you to add uh, a, a term for data variable, and then it searches for any match to that term, and then the user can kind of determine whether or not that's a good match. That's how the tool works. Yeah. Is that clear? I don't know, will it tell if this all also answers your question, uh, but the idea here is to collect data in a very standard way um, across EIA, um, you know, efforts. I, I know a bit more of Sandman, and I think uh, Sandman focuses at the, uh, so it's a smart data management tool, and 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 and. And it 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 includes uh, specific uh, identifiers uh, for traceability of uh, yeah of samples of uh, trials. Meklik, correct me if I'm wrong. No, you are right. <laughs> yeah, which which I don't I don't I don't think it's uh, it's uh, in in it's the case in a, in in e agrology. E agrology provides more uh, the the overarching uh, yeah processes to to basically from a data from data already collected uh, pass it on to and, and and prepare it for model uh, ingestion for instance but all the previous step of organizing the data collection is not included in e agrology as far as i understand or i have been uh, introduced but maybe others can correct maybe i can add to that i know mandla your hand is up but if i could just add to that eduardo quickly um the idea for for data scribe is also that you know once once you have that data uh, collected i mean what we want to do is also map data scribe and fair scribe both to to create templates in carib so that when you have that data already standardized when you pull up uh, uh, the data set into into carib ideally you would have a templatized version of everything that's already standardized so that the work that you need to do uh, will be reduced and we've talked also about having uh, within the carib workflow or, or you know modified carib workflow to have templatized um, uh, modules essentially for dsat for quests um, so that you know the data you get is model ready that's that's what we're all after is to get model ready data and since uh, agmap has already done work on dsat translation for instance we feel we could probably build a lot on that work and 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 take those templates use them uh, and and ideally save time in in getting to that model ready data Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I, I, and I'm Walatau can correct me. I think where he's coming from is that uh, in your description, Meklit, you mentioned the importance of the data that we're getting from the farmers, right? Uh, as part of the, the modeling uh, process. Now, my understanding is that e agrology also has got a, a function where they collect data yield and practice data from farms and then they use that to fine tune uh, their recommendations going forward so it's almost it creates a feedback uh, from uh, from farm from activities farm productivity and so forth and i'm assuming that's where our uh, willetta was angling uh, towards thanks yeah, um, maybe I also create some misunderstanding there then, because there is a research data and, and, and a survey data. 
So when I say the data that is required with an Achillimo, I'm talking about the research data. Um, different treatments being tested next to each other. Otherwise, the data that we, we need as a local soil fertility indicator at a, at a model um, training level, when we are still working in our own environment to, to, to generate the recommendation, it is the control yield we have within our research trial data that is our guide. So the model is trained based on the control yield that we have. When we go out there and deliver for farmer X at that point, when we fill in, that control will be from our research data will be replaced by the data that is at that point telling us, and then that will be converted into in which class is then this farmer's soil fertility, that will be entered. And the computation behind it will be in real time. So um, the data that we need is done. It really needs to be a, a research data, not, not a survey data. That was why I was also a bit confused when Patricia asked, can we get the survey data of uh, uh, Akilimo? I was, but that is specifically for cassava <laughs> as a baseline we used it and so on. So maybe this clarifies it a bit more. So. Patricia, you need to go not after survey data, but after research data. Some publications on small trials somewhere being done, that kind of thing. And, and if we go back to the e-agrology, one thing I know is they were struggling still to make it work offline. It wasn't, it didn't have the capability of working offline yet. That, that I know, and I guess even the starting point with, with uh, Sandman, Agrofims, then new, to be Dataverse, data scribe, and e agrology the starting point itself is also different. They were, they started from a challenge of uh, delivering advisory into a large number of farmers through the extension system. So the, the area they try to fill is that one where Probably we need to look when we are thinking about Mandela as well touched upon it on this feedback loop and so on. I think that is where their strength lies. While in the in the data scribe, the major focus would be you are still probably going out and doing your research. Still research trials are running. You're running validation trials. Then your recommendation next to the farmer's uh, thing. That is another component or you are doing like the adrons kind of uh, survey data. Well, with the farmers that are working with you within research or validation step to get their feedback. Um, so I guess these three things need to come from the different angles together, but I, I, I never understood it that they could be put next to each other to select one from the other. It is rather different angles they are focusing at. So Eduardo is saying, um, I don't think uh, e-agrology and Sandman are similar tools, but e-agrology can work on top of data managed through Sandman agrofins to ingest into a model. Uh, Meta added, <laughs> e-agrology ETL is more comparable to the car workflow than to these data collection tools. I think we are saying the same thing, are we Meta? Probably, but you're probably saying it better than I am, Meklet. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Well, let out. Does it? Did it answer the question for you a bit, or otherwise? What we do you think? Maybe um, Meda? Would it be good really to have something, something concrete to understand and to see the strings of what e agrology is and how they could feed with each other? Would that help? Yeah, I, you know, we had a session on e-agrology early on, but I think we should probably have similar sessions to this, maybe set up two or so, because we we just touch the surface of things and we come away thinking we've understood, but in fact, you know, we it's not the case, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, so I can write to Andrea and ask, I'm due to talk with Julian tomorrow anyway, I think. 
Um, so I will pick it up with him as well because he's been immersed in that. So would be good to know more for sure. I, uh, you know, we were, we also had a conversation with SIP, uh, David Ramirez and and uh, Javier, who who works with David on because they've been using agrofins and and they're also uh, tying into into the ETL processes of eagrology. And 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 so I think many of these things are starting to want to come together in ways that are flexible and and make sense for a number of different entry points and users uh, preferences. And so this is a long winded way of saying, yes, I, I think they should be presenting as well. I'll follow up. Patricia, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, sorry, maybe I'm too old school. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. But um, I just wanted to know how certain are the outputs from these, uh, for example, with uh, uh, Kilimo, because I see uh, there will be a lot of data, for example, coming from other sources, like different sources and then being put together and then doing an analysis and then a recommendation. I'm uh, taking it, yes, from my uh, situation or the work here that we want to do with uh, here in Southern Africa. I thought uh, we, we could uh, look at what data are, are available in the different uh, use cases and then maybe input them in a format that uh, yeah i don't know what uh, format you guys uh, do have and use uh, but at least that would uh, at least increase uh, certainty in terms of the model interpretations uh, that we can then give uh, to the farmers because i felt that was the whole idea of getting as much information as we can from down here and then uh, inputs into yeah the different um uh, what can i call repositories that you guys are working on and then later on use uh, those data with a bit of some certainty because i see there's a lot of data that's coming from everywhere i don't know thanks Yeah, Patricia, it, it, it is true. Any modeling, anything, your result is as good or as bad as your data. If uh, shitty data is in, your recommendation is not useful. useful. Uh, <laughs> so that is why actually for in your case, if you don't get, uh, I, I, I have, I never worked with Soyabin. Uh, I don't know what kind of research. How extensively this thing is researched, I have no idea. So I'm just giving you a naive response here that if you are, if you don't think like the response data, the 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 nutrient response data that you are getting is from two different environment from your target area and maybe from old times or not very if you are comfortable with it. I guess the best thing to do is spend your first season in conducting. Uh, nutrient omission trials, uh, even if it is being limited in number, and and get a good quality data there. That is uh, that is my advice. But for the rest, all the other data, for instance, if your comment is about whether data is getting from there and the soil is coming from there, yes, there is there is a propagation of error that we cannot help. It will be there, but. If you start, it's always your start point. If your starting point is uh, a blind blanket recommendation that just gives one one value for the whole country, you can improve. You definitely can improve at least because you account for a certain level of information is coming on on the soil, on the growing condition, on your crop response. So the combination of all that, even if the error propagation is there. The benefit is also there coming together. And what is key is then on the validation step. You really need to recycle your data. You have to put in your your learnings from your validation data and tune and tune and tune. And we are hoping someday then we will arrive into a reasonable result. But for for and and 
yeah, like Akili Mo is not like some uh, uh, a refined analytical uh, software where you give it data and it came out. No, it can be super good for a certain crop and for for a, a certain place. Let's not be even say even crop, even cassava. We saw about a 75 percent, more than 75 percent of our farmers definitely saw an increase in yield and profit by applying uh, cassava recommendation. If I apply this thing tomorrow into Mexico, where if given Mexico is different from Tanzania and Nigeria, and I don't have a good data from from Mexico, it might miserably fail. So all these things are. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I do get that uh, point. Uh, make, maybe I'm just lost in terms of uh, how we are. I'm not hearing uh, maybe from the team how, for example, we're going to incorporate uh, uh, site specific data. That's where my uh, uh, comment was coming from, because mm. I'm seeing uh, um, like where we can get like data sources. These are just generic or general data sources. I'm not hearing, for example, how we're going to input, for example, site specific uh, data if we have it. Because all these sites, they are amazing if you don't have the data and if you want to do something general, I hear you. But if you want to make a recommendation, for example, for our case, these are annual crops. You need to be as close uh, to uh, home as uh, possible. So I was just wondering if uh, uh, this, uh, uh, um, uh, the Akilimo, what kind of data formats does it all uh, yeah, does it only have to be from these sites that are being uh, spoken about here, or we can have data from like from on farm, like we can use, uh, uh, yeah, as you are saying, experimental data. I'm just saying I am not hearing how we can incorporate data that are site specific. I'm hearing more of data from different sources and not more of uh, what we have, but uh, if we can use what we have and then maybe, uh, yeah, I think that would be. If anybody want to come in, please just come in. Eh? <laughs> uh, can I say something? Yes, no, yes. I, I didn't follow all the discussions from the start, so maybe I'm going to say something nonsense or not relevant. But I think to the question of Patricia, I think the data all depends. I mean, I think the site specific data or the local data will be used basically to fit different models, right? That's at least the way I take it because yes. the Akilimo framework basically has different steps and different data sets are different to calibrate or to fine tune these different steps so that the data can be made useful for a specific application. And I mean, one thing is clear. I think we cannot use data from cassava to parameterize a model for soybean. I mean, I think that's that's obvious. So I think some sort of, I mean, I don't know, groundwork, field work to actually get some proper experimental information to yeah. feed these tools and these models, I think is absolutely key. And I think I can give an example, a crop model. I mean, gave, I, I talked with Isaiah later, actually, uh, uh, later uh, last week, actually, about this. I think having a one one experiment, you know, that you have all the detailed information that you can actually over two seasons in one site that you can measure, make detailed measurements to calibrate a crop model. This sounds to me to be sort of well, a very basic exercise to do actually. But now, if you want, uh, uh, yeah, fertilizer recommendation trials or fertilizer recommendation information, I think the type of experimental setup to gather this information is just going to be completely different. Maybe on farm and maybe with different types of measurements. So I'm not sure there is a, a one solution fits all here, but I think it has to be very much driven by the question and by the objective of the applications that are to be devised, I would say. And this should basically guide where to allocate the resources to the different to different experimental work. But anyway, these are just my comments from listening to the discussion, but I'm not sure if I'm missing a point here or uh, if that if that helps. Anyways, happy to hear. Your <laughs> no, 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 you're you're exactly on top of it, uh, Ja. That is that is the answer I would also give. Yeah, that is it. So, Patricia, indeed, you know, uh, if the experimental data come from your region where you focus, that makes it site specific because the response to nutrient 
is relevant. It came from your site. So um, you, you select, if you have a large area, you select representative locations, you conduct research, and that will be the input in this. In this, it doesn't. Yeah, it, let's for now. Let's just because it is Akilimu we are discussing. Let's go on thinking Akilimu, but it doesn't need to be Akilimu. You can take Akilimu's framework and, and and build something. But in that in that build, your site specific research data you have, your target area soil, your target area rainfall, your target area input and output prices, your target area planting and harvesting them. That is what makes it site specific for your location. So what Akilimo gives is just a framework. It doesn't demand you uh, to use uh, or it, it doesn't even make the recommendation based on the data that is now in the system. It doesn't use that. It uses the data that you provide you. Provide it. And um, yeah. Is that uh, is that a bit did it answer at least a percent of your your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Uh thank yeah. sorry uh for no, bringing no. in critique. No, 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 no. That's why this is these are all relevant questions. And and it is very good they are asked. <laughs> yeah, I answered already. Why are you using? Why can we use this and and and, and craft the two crop models together? That one you, you didn't hear, but the output of this art is the input of craft because this art gives me the water limited yield, which is like my yield ceiling, and that will be an input in the crafts and craft relates soil nutrient supply through uptake of the crop to the yield that is possible to get for that crop. So these are like sequential. One comes after the other. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, Mandela is gone. Thank you, Mandela. <laughs> bye bye. I'm already what? Four minutes late, I see it. <laughs> I have a I have a question. Yeah that I'm going to ask, even though it may be a very stupid question, but I'm not a technical person, so I'm just going to put it out there anyway. Uh, I think Eduardo and Siebus have heard me ask this in various forms, but, you know, we say from time to time that to do any kind of machine learning, you need a lot of data. Um, and if you don't have that amount of data, then you turn you know, more to sort of the crop modeling and this kind of uh, approach, which can take time. But but what I'm wondering is, um, I mean, this this all sounds very time consuming and complicated to me, especially based on, you know, what Patricia br brought up um, and needing data regardless. I mean, you need regardless of what approach you use, you obviously need good quality data. That's clear. What I'm wondering is, do we really need to to go through this approach or can we get somewhere through a, a, a much more machine learning focused approach where, yes, you need data, but that data could be from a variety of different places and you could still derive some useful information from it. I mean, in the end, our goal is not to be 100% correct. Our goal is to increase farmers' productivity and profitability by X amount. And sure, there could be differences between one approach or another. I mean, I'm sure there's not one clear answer, but I'm just putting this out there because I'm struggling to, I have struggled with this for some time. Um, and I don't think the comparison exists where people have done you know, this is what we get if we use this approach. This is what we get if we use a purely machine learning approach. Or at least if they have, then I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't know. Um, well, actually, that's not true. I know that for um, that Camila, Jordan, and Robert did that with their, you know, they compared uh, sort of a much more quests associated approach and a much more machine learning approach. And I don't think they they found much in the way of differences. But I don't know. Is that a silly question, or or can somebody just? Uh, no, it's not. It's respond? not a silly question. No, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I wish Willetau could speak because 
the analytics. See, I see the dots dancing on his name. He's yeah. really trying to respond very, very quickly, but that I wish it <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> Well, let out try to speak. Maybe you can. <laughs> Because his model is really very, very much, um, it leans a lot on the machine learning. But they do have about 6,000 response data. So it is data rich, okay, from a very highly, I'm also wishing he said, try it, try to speak, let out. Oh. No. We no. miss you, Willa Tau. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I... I, I did, they did a yeah. lot on, on machine learning. They do have about, I don't know, I mean, the, the latest one, maybe last year when he was using, he didn't have 6,000, but still substantial amount of data, response data, historically coming from different regions, different people, and so on, through different years. Um, and that in combination with um, response curves, that is that is the major, the, the, the center, the core of the analytics was that. And they even, he even improved his analytics this year by making, um, by fitting 3D instead of just 2D, instead of NPK differently, he merged them together that when he fitted the response curve for N, it, it consults the P and K availability, different labels as well. So he created uh, several matrix of combination of the possible combination of the three variables and all of them were fed together with the rest of the parameters into the machine learning. And and and, and the result is really, really, really impressive. I mean, they, they really saw very good yield increase. Um, in, in Ethiopia, that still still needs to consult the economics that which he, he will do the coming seasons. But from agronomic point of view, reaching an agronomic minimum, if you have that kind of data power, that will be possible. Especially at this point, when we are when we are imp improving from blanket recommendation, we can do that. Um, on the other hand, in using the crop models, it all seems complicated and a long, long, long process if when it is not figured out, when it is not, when you don't have still the scripts, when you don't still, do not still know how you're going to source this data and that data and that your special data, in which way I'm going to create it. And that is why uh, what I'm sharing at this point, the Akilimo script is just to do exactly that. So once we have already the system, why not using it? It is only a computation power that, that it takes. Now, the, maybe Patricia is worried about how am I going to collect all this important, all this geospatial data and whatever. For those things, we already have a script in place. How am I going to run the quest as a script if there are the soya bean crop par parameters are known? It is replacing those ones, replacing the nutrient omission trial data with, with the soya bean. And then rather it is better to go to the full lengths that we can now, especially because the groundbreaking job is already done. And now it is the fine tuning, the uh, automating, making things work efficient and streamlined. So yeah, I would say Yay, Oleta is saying I perfectly explained it. You <laughs> can I make a comment here as well? Yes, please. I think maybe that's not a silly question at all. I think that's actually a very valid question. Yeah. Um, and I, I wish I would have more answer, my more more answers than questions actually, because there is I, I think there is actually quite a lot of unknowns on on comparing these two approaches. You know, uh, at least in my view, I think of course they are complementary. Um, that's the first one, because I think, of course, if to have a machine learning model, you need data and to, to, to have data, I mean, you have to have something that is currently available, right? There is something that is currently on the ground that you can collect data from. On the other end, of course, if that, if that thing is not on the ground or if that crop is not very grown in a specific region, to be more precise, I'm not sure how can we get all the data to actually feed the machine learning approach in that case. Um, and in such cases, then I think, yeah, crop modeling can really help you making those ex explorations, let's say, or predictions uh, for cases where actually, well, there is very few available on the ground, but still 
uh, with uh, with one trial or whatever, you can parameterize a model that allows you to to extend basically your extrapolation domain in a way. So that's one. And I think the other one is very much around uncertainty because, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if we actually use these machine learning models and start crossing validating them over years, over provinces and things like that. Well, my experience is that generally these models just crash, you know, so they are very good to explain the variation in your data. But as soon as you start predicting, especially for over years that your data did not see, or for regions that your data also did not see, well, the performance generally goes down. Now, well, that, that performance going down, is that satisfactory? Can we live with it or not? Well, I don't know. I think that that has never been really translated, I think, into something practical, to my knowledge. But again, I think these are interesting questions to perhaps dig into and to, to assess, basically, what are opportunities and the, yeah, the opportunities for the different approaches and under which conditions, basically, I think. But, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think more could be said around it, but just these two points for now. No, you're absolutely right. I really fully agree with you. A combination of the two is always what I would advise because the machine learning methods, mostly there is a reason why people say it is a black box thing because the data gets seen, it captures the relationship it could see within the data, but beyond that, the relationship between growing parameters and the crop responses, that, that knowledge it doesn't have. The, 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 the machine learning doesn't have that knowledge. But when you add the crop models and you, especially when you bring it to areas where uh, if there are very highly variable, if your target area is highly variable and, and, and probably there are pockets of areas where that relationship is not captured at all in your data and machine learning cannot think that. Even the range of values that it predicts for you are limited within the range of the data that you have. The input data defines the output range. But the crop model, because there is that inherent biological relationship is already the basis of the crop models, it goes out of the boundaries as well, depending on the input data of some specific locations that are not that are not represented with the input data, the your training data set, it still will be able to give you a more reasonable recommendation for those locations. So ideally, if you really have a data power in your hand, it will be you will be able to capture that response to neutrons much strongly by applying the machine learning, but couple it together with crop models. That is, I think that is what I would uh, recommend. I mean, strengthening jaws. <laughs> I'm just, I just repeated you. Sorry, Joe. Then I wish you a very good afternoon. <laughs>